This is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 293. If the founder believes they don't know everything and they take advice on board, they're the best type of founders because you can mentor them and coach them and they're going to action what you say. Mm -hmm. So, and I always say these guys, I'm not the smartest guy, but I've been to an agency for so many years, I've made a lot of mistakes. You need to learn from the mistakes that I've made, and I've made a lot. G'day, this is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 293, and our guest today is Nick Bell, founder of Superist, on the threat of AI, on addressing productivity gaps, looking after his A players, and living to 150 years old. I am your host, Greg Layton, founder of Chief Maker and the Council of Chiefs, and I believe there is a great chief in all of us and that through listening to the stories, strategies, and techniques of great CEOs, each of you can find and leave your own legacy through your work. The Inner Chief Podcast is where you will learn how to think and make moves like a CEO. For over a decade, I've helped CEOs and senior executives around the world boldly lead change, inspire their people, and leave a legacy. So every two weeks, I'll bring a deep diving interview with one of these CEOs or another one of a mid to large organization so you can find your own path to greatness as an executive. In this special episode, I chat to Nick Bell. He is the founder of Superist, a digital agency group with 18 agencies and over 2,000 employees worldwide. The agency hand selects businesses in the one to five million annual recurring revenue range, advises and mentors the founders while a team of scaling specialists look to improve existing systems and processes. The group has remarkably acquired one digital services agency per month since its inception. Nick left university after just six weeks and years later, after persevering through two failed business ventures, He used his last $350 to his name to launch an SEO digital marketing agency from his bedroom, a business he'd go on to sell for $39 million nine years later. Nick was also one of two Australian celebrity apprentice advisors to Lord Alan Sugar and is also a former AFR Young Rich Lister. Today, you're going to hear Nick talk all about the post-COVID productivity challenge and the threat and benefits of AI, looking after the A players in his teams, what he looks for in the founder when purchasing a business and how his health and wellness regime is going to help him live to 150. Chief, one of the core skills of all great chiefs is the ability to interview and recruit the very best performers to your team. Now, many chiefs say to me that they get up to 25 or even 40% of their recruitment decisions wrong. Now, many of you who listen to this show will know that over the last six years, we have asked dozens of CEOs what is their number one interview question when recruiting for senior roles. What we have done is turn that into an invaluable resource. It is the 30 most powerful interview questions used by CEOs to hire high performers. These are the questions that reveal the true nature of the person in front of you. They are the ones that give or create that truth telling moment that will help you decide whether to hire or not. Chief, if you want this resource, just go to chiefmaker.com forward slash interview and just pop in your details and download the detailed PDF. Let's hear from our incredible guest, Nick Bell. All right, Chiefs, it's just an absolute pleasure now to be here with Nick Bell. Nick, welcome to the Inner Chief Podcast, mate. Mate, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Mate, we have a great tradition here on the Inner Chief. We really like to know where our where our leaders come from. Can you tell a bit of a story that sums up uh, your childhood and early life? Yeah, okay. I, um, I grew up near Bendigo on a small hobby farm. So my parents had sheep, cattle, horses and chickens and all that business. Um, so I, from zero to 18, I lived there. And then uh, as soon as I turned 18, I moved down to Melbourne. Didn't know what I wanted to do and uh, fell into university and then uh, quit that after six weeks and then 
went into hospitality for the next five years, drifting around from job to job. Not drifting around, but just I just had no path of what I wanted to do. I think mm. it's like most young kids these days, they they leave school and go, shit, what am I going to do? Yeah. And I, I was one of those ones where I was like, well, what am I going to do? Because I thought when I was younger, I was going to become a golf professional. And then I realized pretty soon I didn't have the talent to be at the top end of golf. And then if you're in, if you're a mid-level golfer, you're, you're making, you're basically making stuff or you're making nothing. Mm. And most of these golfers are living in the backseat of their cars, traveling between tournament to tournament in Australia. And I thought that's not for me. So then I uh, went into hospitality, did that for a few years. And then I luckily got a job doing data entry for a recruitment company. And I don't know how I got that job because I still type with two fingers. <laughs> so it's I don't, I don't know how I win that job and I got a job doing data. That's right in your, in your hitting zone, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, a job came up within that company to do recruitment, and then I I put my hand up for it, got it. Absolutely loved it, and I loved doing sales at that at that company. And then from there, I just kind of thrived. I, I kind of found my niche, which was I liked working in a, in a corporate environment or an office environment, and then I liked doing sales at the time, and then. Every person I was working with, I thought, guys are lazy. Hospitality for five years, working my ass off for 10, 12, 14 hours a day, I mean, 16 bucks an hour. These guys are getting paid 80 grand a year, doing nine to five. I'm like, if I work harder and faster, I'm going to outdo all these these guys. Mm-hmm. And I did. And then, and then I, know, I, I, I did that for two years, made my employer quite wealthy because I was doing extremely well in recruitment. Mm-hmm. And then thought, I'm making him rich. Why don't I just make myself wealthy? And then went out my own, started my first business, which was a skincare business, which completely failed after five years. <laughs> and I, th- and I, I thought when I started that business, yeah. I go, hey, in the first year, I'm going to make a million bucks. I'm going to make, going to be rich. Yeah. Wasn't the case. Five years later, making 200 bucks a week. And then thankfully then stumbled onto my now current career, which is a digital marketing agency. I started mm. that from my bedroom in 2008. Yeah. Hey, uh, let's talk about that journey in a second. Um, before we do that, uh, we have another question that's, that's critical. What was your first ever car? It was a Mazda 1978 Mazda 626 Canary Yellow from my grandma. I have heard <laughs> <laughs> it was. I was like, Mom, Dad, can I at least have a, a decent looking? Yeah. I think it was called um, Celica back in the day. Like, oh, I think yeah. it was like, and they all sleekers. Yeah. I, I made my head one here, like, I don't know, 70 or 970 something, or 90 yeah. sleek. I was like, Mum, can I have one of them? He goes, No, you can have the Master 626 and you've got to pay for half of it. And I was like, God, it's not that cool, but I'll yeah. take it. It's a car. So I'm not going to. It's a car. Yeah. It's I a like car. the color too. You know, Canary Yellow. It's really. Canary yeah. Yellow. Spot on. So uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't picking up the girls anyway. It was, it was pretty grim, but anyway, yeah. it was good enough. Yeah. Hey, mate, you've had this in- incredible journey. Uh, or, or, you know, you know, you've, I think, 18, 19 agencies uh, you've now started over um, the last yeah, two decades, decades right? Yeah, yeah. A good, good period of time. Two, two but, decades. Just, I'm not that old, mate. It's, it's about uh, it's 14 years. Jeez, two decades. Sorry, mate, I'm blowing my own just time just show, on show you. Show a dinosaur when you say two decades. It's not far uh, away. It's not far away. No, no, I, I, yeah. I actually feel that I'm becoming, not a dinosaur, but if I don't, get up to date with AI, I will become a dinosaur in this space. Yeah. I think it's scaring the life out of, it's scaring the hell out of a lot of us, to be honest, um, you know, and, and for good reason, the, the the amount of power. I want to talk to you in a minute about um, what you're doing with budget SEO and how you've used AI to sort of create a product there. But before we do that, like, can we, let's just talk more broadly about what's going on with the economic cycle, strategy, tech change, social change, because you've got a real passion for strategy. Clearly you you get it because you're able to launch businesses and find the right niche and solve a problem that is bang on at the minute. Um, you don't have a perfect success rate, which I think I also want to talk about, right? Um, strike rate is is good, but you first hit, you know, first hit. First, first, hit, first, hit, first it was a fail, but the rest, yeah. was, I mean, there's been some been failures good. in between, but the rest have been not bad. Yeah, cool. Anyway, let's just because a lot of chiefs these days, and that's most of our audience, they're they're flying through life, mate, and it is busy. There's overwhelm. There's 200, 200 emails a day. Uh, they've got mm. people issues. What a lot of them really battle to do is to stop for a minute 
helicopter out of their business and ask, hey, what are the trends and what's going on and how do we adapt our strategy in order to make good moves, right? Yep. You've got a real passion for this. So um, what have you learned about strategy over the last decade or so that you have found you go back to again and again? Uh, the good question, I think, uh, first and foremost, is you've got to have a very strong sales and marketing arm because without the revenue, there is no business. So in the early days, when I started my first agency, I was basically basically fixing the plane as it was flying. So I was bringing business in the door and, and then initially I was going, okay, here, I've got the work in, I'm going to execute it. But I was like, okay, how am I going to execute it efficiently and effectively? And I was very manual back in the early days. And then as the plane kept flying and flying, I improved the efficiencies in the business. But I always had a very strong sales and marketing process. So in terms of generating leads, closing opportunities, I could always do that quite well. And then as time went on, I became more efficient in the back end because if you've got a leaky funnel, no matter how much business you bring in, you're just going to lose it anyway. So you've got to make sure you overpromise, you basically deliver on what you promise on mm. and you don't, you don't lose a client at the back end because you can never, ever scale if you lose all your clients. And in very, very early days, that's what was happening. So I go, okay. I took a step back, looked at the entire business and go, okay, where are the leaks in the business? How can I fix all these issues? And then put systems and processes in place to resolve the issues. I'm, I'm big on process for this, a process for this and a system for this. If I could automate it or put a system in place, I'll do that rather than mm. manual, 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 which, which I think is very, I think it's needed right now. And I'll tell you why. Mm. I think there's a, a global productivity issue as yeah. we speak. I think... And it was actually in the AFR, I think, recently, the productivity globally has definitely declined. And I think it's post-COVID. It could be maybe it's working from home, maybe not. But my theory is not everyone is disciplined. Mm. So some people some people can work amazingly well at home. But then other people have distractions. They're either they've got kids, they've got Netflix, they're day trading. And what we've found is some productivity at home, it's just gone... Mm dropped so the way i said if i'm still paying you a salary of just say it's a hundred thousand dollars and at work you're here but at home you're here i'm effectively losing half my money when you're working from home Mm. which is hurting my bottom line and hurting the client because you're not delivering the outcome so i think there's an issue here an issue for most employers that how do you maximize productivity post-covid this is a real issue that i don't think it's been addressed hard enough but will come to a head eventually yeah i'm not sure if you've noticed this at all well, without a doubt, it, I would say um, so. I hold the council of chiefs uh, calls and dinners, and, and without my client base, I would say people productivity and attracting retaining talent is number one right now. Yeah, and, and we know. Um, I think the Gartner research says that um, pre-COVID, the number one reason why people chose or stayed at a job was salary. Right um, now, it's the and I think. Two was progression and three was something else. But now number one is career progression development. Number two is balance. And number three is salary. Yeah. yeah. So people have flipped it on their head. And there's a really different world out there. It's, and I, there's a whole range of reasons I think it happened. But there's a definite shift in the way we've got to look after our people. And that has a direct impact on how we run our business. It, there's a definite shift in Victoria where Victoria had one of the longest lockdowns in the world. Yeah, so it's now it's work it work it, yeah likewise and so working remote working from home is now yeah. part of life that's right and what what, what we're finding is mm. if we if we have staff that aren't performing we we bring them in five days a week for a certain amount of time mm. and they go i'm, I'm just going to resign mm. but I, my, 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 my argument is that's fine because regardless you're not working anyway at home mm. so if you resign you're probably doing me a favor so it's it's a very interesting situation where other countries that had minimal lockdowns, many of the staff are working in the office four or five days a week. In our mm. in our office in Vienna, uh, there is no work from home. Mm. In our office in Hong Kong, there's no work from home. But mm. in Melbourne, we kind of have to because to compete with talent, we have mm. to offer work from home. Yeah. So yeah. We've, what we've done is we've, we've basically negotiated this with with the staff saying. Uh, if you're not performing, you have to come in five days a week for a month and your manager needs to come in with you because mm. they obviously haven't managed you properly. 
So they're like, shit, I've got to start working. Otherwise, I've got to start coming to the office five days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so that we've, we've had to kind of use this. Yeah. I, I hate to say ultimatum. It's almost an incentive just to get them work. So they, because hmm. they don't want to come in five days a week. And that's, that's fine. Yeah. They, they want to stay home because they've got the plumber coming over or they've got their, hmm. someone coming over. But it's it's a whole different world that you need to accommodate for, but you need to make sure you get the same level of output out of these people. Because if you don't, I have to increase my prices to my clients and I don't want to do that because I'm not going mm. to be competitive. Yeah. So how do, I, how do I maintain a certain price and productivity where I still can make a margin in between? Mm. That's becoming the challenge. Yeah, I think it's becoming a massive challenge. And as uh, we're watching salaries go up in the market, and that's really clear, that's going up. There's inflation everywhere. Customers are just starting to go, wow, man, how much do we have to pay for these services? This is out of control. It's out of control. Yeah. yeah. And I think it, 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 will hit a, it will hit some sort of limit. Um, but there is a nuance to it. And, and I think you're describing the nuance that you're applying to it, right? But what yeah. I think is also very interesting is people who are working across jurisdictions. Uh, like we do work in Africa and there's no work from home there, right? Uh, there's very little yeah. work for our clients in London. Um, there's much less work from home in Queensland. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was yeah. never really any lockdown here, right? Not lockdown, yeah. And um, then I think Hong Kong, we've got uh, clients in Hong Kong. The, the challenge there is there's nowhere to work from home because everyone lives in a shoebox. Yeah, <laughs> right. so, exactly right. You know, we've we've get to the office because that's where the space is, you know. We've got staff in Hong Kong that go, we want to work from home. I'm like, I know you live in a shoebox apartment <laughs> with, with, with three other siblings and your parents. Yeah. So how can you possibly yeah, focus that's right. in that apartment? That's right. Um, yeah. But it, but it, they don't want to travel in the, the 30 minutes to work. And I, I understand that. So it's it's a chicken and egg mm-hmm. scenario. Yeah. The issue is, the issue is in, in in Victoria where people want to work from home almost full time. And so yeah. you've also got to look, can I outsource your role to overse- overseas mm-hmm. and save a third? So mm-hmm. if your role can be outsourced, there's another challenge. But I, I said to our mm-hmm. team recently, with AI coming into play, if you're mediocre at your role, as a friend to a friend, you're in trouble because if I'm yeah. if I'm mediocre, I'm in trouble yeah. because AI is AI. Whether it's going to you think it's going to benefit society or not, it is going to take jobs, one hundred percent, without a doubt. So if you're mediocre at your role and you can potentially be either replaced by AI or someone internationally because you want to work from home, mm. you're in trouble. So AI yeah. is going to force people to be much better at their craft mm. than they were previously. I want to pick up on this because a little bit of what you're saying has been, you know, a bit of the ultimatum or let's get back to work, let's do this. But at the core of your success and and just about every chief we've had on this show is a mindset around career. So what there's a couple of um, uh, philosophies we carry. Uh, one is that um, in business, your boss is your number one customer, right? And if you don't treat them as a customer and like solve their problems and do a great job for them, then they'll never... I'm going to keep buying your services, right? And that the second half is your professional services firm of one, right? And so you really need to keep adapting and getting better and offering services. So, and I keep hearing, this is sort of coming through in the way you're talking about, you know, really going above and beyond other people. What, what's, your, what's your guidance to those listening about mindset and the way to approach your career? So I'll take a step back. One thing I promised myself recently is, to look after my A players better. Yeah. So I'm going to double down and go, if someone who really wants to wants a career mm. and wants to build a substantial life for themselves, I'm going to do everything possible to make that happen. So I'm going to go, okay, let's map out your career. Let's do it together. And if I can make that happen, I will. Yeah. So one thing, I've always looked after A players, but I've known an A player is someone I'm going to go into battle with and I know they've got my back I can trust them to deliver an outcome and they're going to kick some ass. Mm. And so what I'm, what I'm focused on right now is, okay, here's my list of A players. Yep. How, how can I help you succeed in life? Because if you win, I'm going to win as well. So what I've done is sat down with each individual one and mapped out the next 12 to 18 months with them. And you go, this is what it looks like. This is the career progression. This is what you're going to do. And, and some of these A players, they're juniors as well, but you can just mm. see they're going to do well in life. Yeah. Like you can always you can always pick the ones that are going to go. They've got common sense. They present well. They talk well, and they put the work in. Mm. Like you, the, the the knowledge you can teach them, you can't teach them common sense. Mm. 
So I'm like, okay, so I've identified who are the ones with common sense, all these traits. Let's map out their career and see and bring them on the journey with you. Yeah. The reason is, and if, if they put the work in and really want to build something, man, they could, if you're an absolute savage right now and you, you really want to build something, there's so many opportunities because so many people are choosing work-life balance and, and power to them. That's their choice. Yeah. Their choice. Hmm. But if you want more than that, there's a real opportunity in the market right now to build something substantial. And I think the uh, there's an underlying thing here where we see work-life balance is stepping back. And I don't necessarily think it always is. I think if it's about when you get to work, you just switch on and absolutely nail that mm. sort of eight to 12 hours a day, whatever you choose to work. But mm. I think a lot of people are turning up and operating at 60 to 80% of their potential because of either distraction or they're not mastering their craft, like you said, or they're not dialing in and really being 100% present and driving forward. So there's, there's both there, right? And you've got these A players that clearly are dialing in and you're like, hey, I want to reward those people. Let, let's take them on the journey. Yeah. And 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 anyone who, if you're in a, in a role and you're looking up and your boss is sitting there and they got problems and they want to solve and they're driving forward and you're the one in there going to bat for them, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go to bat for you. Yes, yeah, like correct. You're, right? you're saying, I want to, I want to grow these A-listers. So if I, if I take a bit of a step back, I, uh, you know, initial question was around strategy and you, you sort of know, and two, you've spoken about two things in particular, or three really. So one was... Not in strategy, know your sales and marketing and sort that funnel out because without that, no strategy works. Yeah. Two, get your productivity right. <laughs> and three, look after A-listers. Yeah. I, I think the reason I say productivity because no matter how good your strategy is, without productivity and work ethic, you yeah, can't execute it's it. It's not going to work. Yeah. It's, nothing's going to work. Yeah. And I, people always complain, uh, not complain, they go, how do, I, how do I hire the right person? How do I get them to deliver an outcome i mm. said look you've just got to hire a right culture fit for you mm. someone who is aligned with your values someone who you can get along with and someone who knows is going to put the work in and i'm not saying work from seven to eight every day i might know even nine to five thirty mm. from nine to five thirty and your one hour lunch and your two breaks just give me 100 yep. percent. that's all i'm asking nothing mm. more don't work you don't need any overtime in my businesses yep. but the one but like you mentioned earlier the ones that are doing running at 40 percent it's like, come on, man, really? Yeah. Yeah, you're actually crushing your dreams and crushing my dreams because I want to I want to build this, basically, this huge business that I'm really proud of and I want you to become part of it. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what we're going to plan to do is in the next few years is basically potentially do an IPO. Yep. Um, and all key people in the company will get shares in the business or if that doesn't work, we'll do an employee share option sure. where all key people will get shares in the company. Yeah. But I'm only going to reward the people that have been on the journey and really put the work in. Mm. So the ones that are actually doing the 30, 40% productivity, I'm like, you're actually hurting yourself. You're not hurting me. Mm. And life will come and go and you'll move on to somewhere else and you'll be in the same position you're in now and you'll just go through a circle. And then when you're 60 years old, mm. you're going to go, shit, what have I done? Yeah, I left I left some things on the table, right? Left, I left a lot on the table. And now, yeah. I'm, like, now I'm basically, I'm in a bit of pain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's that, I don't know if you've heard that saying, like, uh, my worst hell is um, that the man I am meets the man that I could have been. You've heard that saying? I like it. No, I haven't, but I like that. It's, I like yeah. it. it's good. It's sort of something that, um, that I've taken on over the last few years, and it really does, it just makes you step up. Right. Yeah. It's, okay. Well, I don't want to have any regrets at the end of this. I want to go for it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go for it with family. I'm going to go for it with fitness and health. I'm going to go for it with business. I'm going to go for it with my friends, but I'm not going to hold back. Um, yeah. Don't hold back. And I, and I think with AI coming into play, if you're in cruise control at the moment, no yeah. matter, not all, all industries, but many industries are going to be disrupted. Yeah. Many, 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 mm -hmm. many, many, including mine. And if I'm in cruise control in 10 years, I'm wiped out. And you're wiped. Yeah. 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 I'm going ski. So, yeah. and I, I guarantee many players in my space will be wiped out within a few years. Yeah. So the strategy is put the work in. <laughs> uh, you put the work, put the work in. Make sure you, you you've nailed all your one percenters in your business. Yeah. So I'm I'm big on details. Even if there's an email signature that's not aligned, I'm like, hey, or it's broken. I'm like, hey, can you fix this? Da, 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 da. Every client touch point needs to be amazing. All the one percenters need to be on point mm. because any mistakes, especially with AI now, you're in you're in deep shit. Yeah. Now, Chief, do you want to go on a journey? 
where your leadership shifts from being intuitive to being practical, systemized, and inspiring. That is why one of our students has described the Mini MBA, a transformational program where we work with you on your business to systemize the way you lead and to get results. So much so that I guarantee results. If you're not happy with the program, I'll give you 100% of your money back. In fact, the NPS for the program is over 91. That absolutely, to be honest, it belts our opposition. I think the best in the market would need to be just over 70. So we are absolutely leading the game in a program that matches the most cutting edge material in the market with cutting edge coaching skills. And that is where so much of the other programs in the market fall over. They can't do both. They're not bad at coaching or they're not bad at materials. We're the best at both. Righto, Chief. If you want to get involved, check out chiefmaker.com forward slash mini MBA. Hey, um, let's just talk about any pivots you've made. Like one in particular is uh, this new business called Budget SEO. Now, yep. I'm reading between the lines here. This uh, I don't have all the detail that you do, but what I'm sort of guessing is you've seen this uh, customer sentiment shift around people and a bit more pressure from a cash perspective. You've yeah. seen the rise of AI and you've gone, look, there's an opportunity where these two meet. Is it, has it been sort of like that? And, and if it is, can you tell us a bit about Budget SEO in your own words? Yeah, definitely. So Budget SEO is purely formed out of two reasons. One, we're heading to a recession. So yep. Interest rate rises, people are tying up their purse strings, yeah, but they still need marketing. So mm-hmm. they, instead of paying two or three thousand dollars a month for marketing, how can I get the price down to say three or four hundred dollars? Mm-hmm. And if it's purely on labor or using labor, I could never do that because, as you know, wages in Australia are expensive. It's it's impossible. So I thought, okay, how can I use AI to perform marketing for a, for a business? So I've looked at it, all these different tools. I said, this will work, this won't work. How can I integrate this into the business? So using um, three different types of tools, uh, which I've integrated, I can now do people's marketing for a fraction of the cost. So instead of paying four grand, you can basically, you're not going to get the Rolls Royce, don't get me mm. wrong. Yeah. Mm. You're not going to get a Rolls Royce, but you're going to get a Kia, which is a lot better than nothing. For, mm. for a couple of hundred bucks. Yeah, sure. And yeah. you're still, still going to get results on Google. So it's basically purely born out of necessity. Mm. Uh, but what, you, what you're going to find is a lot of companies are, are adapting AI, but they're not passing on the cost savings to the client. Mm. Whereas I'm like, no, no, no. I'd rather reduce my fee to the client, gain more clients, they win and I win. Mm. And I'll just have lower margins. Sure. But you're going to find a lot of companies that are going, no, 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 we're going to keep the price at X amount and just increase our profit margin, which is going to happen. Yeah. But eventually that, that's going to bite them in the ass. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's budget SEO, right? We'll, we'll put some yeah. links to that in the show notes. Um, no, number two, this this Superist, right, which is uh, the, the banner. The parent company. The parent yeah. company of of your of your brands and the, these digital agencies. Can you talk to, um, you said you've got this grand vision. Can you talk to that vision? Just share it with us. Like I, I think people will be, I love hearing someone talk about the thing they're trying to build. Yeah, definitely. So everyone knows about, oh, not everyone, but you've got agencies like Dentsu, WPP, which have been around 20, 30 years, juggernaut of agency groups mm. worth billions and billions of dollars. And I look, I'm impressed with what they've done, but I'm not impressed with with the quality of their work. Mm. So and I'm like, okay, I, th- I think I can build a much better agency group that delivers better quality work at a faster rate than all these large agency groups. So what I started doing is I, I started an agency back in 2008. I sold it in 2017. I was going to exit the agency game. And then I thought, no, man, I kind of know this industry backwards. So I thought, okay, I've still got another six or seven agencies in Asia that I'll keep. And then I thought, why don't I just start another one? And then, I, and then I started another one and then I bought one. I'm like, actually, this is becoming a bit of a, a bit of a giant group because this is, our revenues are now pushing $200 million. I'm like, when you get to that size an agency, it's quite rare. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, how, how big can I actually get this? But I'm, 
I'm not buying agencies and they're, they're doing one client. These are agencies that range from, say, ne- doing clients such as Netflix to Disney to Joe's Plumbing. Mm-hmm. So it's a variety of clients. But everything is tracked and measured. The output is measured. So I'm thinking, okay, how large can I get this agency groups? And then we launched in Austria uh, about two months ago. Then we're launching in Ireland next week. Then I'm launching in Amsterdam in September. So I'm thinking, okay, we're at, just say we're at $200 million now. How can, how can I get it to half a billion dollars in revenue and 5,000 people? And just keep in mind, when I started this business 14 years ago, my first agency, I was just happy to make 100 grand from my bedroom. So it was meant to be a side hustle from my bedroom, make $100,000 a year, mm. and then I'm content. Mm. And then it's now kind of compounded into this mm-hmm. juggernaut. Now we've got two, just over 2,000 people and, and growing exponentially. Yeah. Mm. And what a great story. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's 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 good because we haven't raised any money. It's all self funded. Yeah, which I don't I don't know how long I can keep doing that for because my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I keep buying all these businesses, and she just goes, "You can stop using our family money to buy all these yeah. uh, businesses." I said, "I don't want any partners just yet." Yeah, yeah. So, but I, but when I'm buying these agencies, I'm I, we only buy fifty to seventy percent, mm-hmm. and you've got to make sure you buy an agency with the right founder or founders. Mm, mm. It always comes down to the people running the business because if, if they're not suitable, the whole business will collapse. Yeah. So we bought one recently called the lab group and they've got a bit, they've got um, your social and um, our people. It's like an organic social media agency and it's owned by Sam Murray. He's an ex footballer. The guy is an absolute sponge. I, I, I said, mate, let's do this, this and this. He just goes away that week does it comes back next week nick it's all done bang 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 like mm. oh man you are good you actually do stuff thank you and as a result his business is growing rapidly in the past three months since mm. we purchased his business if the founder believes they don't know everything and they take advice on board they're the best type of founders because you can mentor them and coach them and they're going to action what you say mm. so i and I always say to these guys I, i'm not the smartest guy but it, I've been to an agency for so many years. I've made a lot of mistakes. You need to learn from the mistakes that I've made. And I've made a lot. Yeah. And behind all this is a system, right? So you're you're applying principles and a system behind this, right, towards agency growth. Yeah, Yeah. correct. The whole thing is a system. So Mm. from lead generation to marketing to onboarding clients to managing clients, the whole thing is a formula. Yeah. That I replicate in every single agency. Mm. So how to, and if a client leaves, we send them gifts, how to off, off-board a client. Like the whole thing is a, it's rinse and repeat process. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, um, one of the things I've noticed about um, Chiefs over the years, uh, and I've studied a lot of this in the psychology of high performance, is the quality of their mental models. And the, the reason it becomes quite clear is that I'll ask a question and they'll answer the question, like, like it might be quite a difficult question. They'll answer with absolute clarity and really quickly. And go one, two, and almost like you can see them reeling off that there's a bit of a system going process in the background. And I, I, I actually truly believe that knowing your system and your mental models about how you make decisions on the fly, or even when you are systematically changing something, those mental models or those systems are so core to individual success that without it, I just don't know how you can be. Mm, does, that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, it comes from experience. It's not because absolutely, yeah, you're an absolute genius. It's no, I've made a crap load of mistakes. Yeah. And you just learn from those mistakes. And from yeah. those mistakes, you, you create a formula that works and you can rinse and repeat yeah. it in most businesses. Yeah. Um, I, I started a lot of the work of Edwards Deming in the early days. Do you know Edwards Deming, the, the founder no. of Process Excellence? So he was the guy, the American guy that Toyota brought to Japan to teach them process excellence. And, and even now, the annual quality award in Japan is called the Edwards Deming Award by an American award in Japan. And he had this line, which is, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing, right? Um, but the okay. critical thing that Deming brought in Japan was that the loop or the manufacturing process or system that had the loop of review, right? And they were just going back and doing things again and again and again, but they weren't doing yep. the stop the helicopter view like you're saying, hey, we, we made a mistake. How do we do that better? How do we do this better? And a lot of most leaders, I think, are going to work every day and they're just running their system. 
But yeah. they're not doing the stop and the step out and go, oh, let's look at the numbers, let's look at the way people are responding, and let's actually take a process of, of, of proper improvement. Yeah. What what I recommend all the chiefs listening to this is one day every quarter is grab your management team and go through each department individually. So mm. you basically go just even go off site somewhere for a day mm. and start with each start with the department and go, okay, let's talk about the challenges of the sales team. And then just say John's running the sales team. John, tell us about the challenges. He goes, da 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 da. And then every other manager will go, okay, John, here's what I think is the issue with the sales team. And they get we go through each of the challenges when you put solutions in place. And then we do the account servicing team. And then we do I don't know, the finance team and so on. We do this once a quarter. Yeah. Right. Super important, yeah. super yeah. important. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels. Yeah. You, you, you're just doing the day-to-day spinning wheels, but actually not improving the business. Yeah. And, and can I just talk about why it's so important to make it quarterly? Because annually, a lot of people do an annual offsite. They then don't meet again for another year, right? It's too long. Like too long. people just drift off course. And so yep, it's too long. Yeah. Do you do do you yep. do a quarterly for yourself as well? Or something where you take yourself away without people? Is that monthly or quarterly? Do you do anything like uh, that? no, that's a good question. When I go on holiday, uh I get the best ideas when I'm on holiday for three or four days. Yeah. So and my, my wife hates it because I'm like, ah oh, shit, I've got the best idea. <laughs> and let's go through on my last holiday, I mapped out budget SEO. Yeah. I was in, I think I was in Sydney at the um stay at the park height there for a few days and then I got I got this idea. Yeah. Mapped it out, bought the bought the domain name, okay, this is how I'm gonna do it. Got back to Melbourne, bang, rolled it out. Mm. So yeah, I, I do go off site, I just on holiday for a few days and I yeah. map out ideas. Yeah. But in terms of the business itself, I like to do it with the managers. So they're all on board, yeah. they're all on board. Otherwise, yeah. it's it's me just rolling in going, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yeah. And they're not on board. Yeah, it ain't gonna work. Yeah, yeah, it ain't gonna work. Yeah. So, and they're gonna push back and go, "No, nah, mm. I don't like Nick's idea." Yeah. You need to have them drinking the Kool Aid. Mm, mm. Absolutely. I mean, let's talk about um, fitness and health uh, longevity. You know, you've got a real, uh, you got a real passion for this. You've always been um, somewhat of a fitness junkie um, and a health junkie. Um, let's just talk about a few different things. Um, what is the science revealing to us now um, about the factors that drive long-term health. Well, it's, it's not even science now. It's I was reading an article the other day that the, mo- the, the most important factor for longevity in life is exercise. Mm. Like exercise is still number one. Um, one thing that's actually changed my life recently, though, is daily ice baths. So I've had a lot of inflammation in my body. I've had some bad knees from football. And for years and years, I just could not shake the inflammation. And I got my blood work done. My blood's were even saying you've got a lot of inflammation in your body. So I thought, and I've, I've done stem cells in the Cayman Islands. I've done mm. stem cells in the US. It worked, but not to the, to the degree I needed it to work. Mm-hmm. Yes. So then I started doing a, an ice bath, which is nothing, cost me nothing to do. Mm. And over two and a half months, my blood pressure went down. The inflammation in my body went down. My knee pain disappeared i re- i lost body fat because mm. you shiver because you're shivering yeah, obviously yeah yeah and i was like okay this is a massive tick so i'm going to keep this in the regime so one yeah. uh, ice baths two i eat fairly clean as well um, i don't eat sugar and that crap but don't get wrong i still like a beer and a drink mm. so i'm not i'm not i'm not a complete saint but i just yeah. everything's in moderation what else do I do? Uh, I do a lot of in, interval training, so a lot of sprinting. Yeah. So I might, I might go to the park next door and sprint for 20 seconds, rest for 20 seconds, sprint 20 seconds, and so on. And I, I do basically all of this, and I don't, know, I, I don't get really sick at all. Mm. Um, I'm generally pretty healthy, and I'm because I'm trying to live to 150 years old. So uh, I'm trying to. There's a, there's a guy called Dr. David Sinclair, and he's trying to live to 100 years old, and I've I've befriended um david sinclair mm. and i'm like tell me what are you working on dave what are you, what are you working on tell me what you're working on right now yeah uh, so he's regrowing retinas at the moment and regrowing ears i'm like okay how can i utilize this in my in my, my life yeah. and he goes nothing yet but I'll, I'll keep you updated but i also take yeah. um like you should see my supplement regime it's it's intense yeah 
So um, I'm actually in the process of opening a longevity clinic in Melbourne. Yeah, tell me about it's, this. It's good. So it's going to do everything from blood work because your blood mm. work says everything. Mm. So you could say the amount of inflammation in your body and inflammation leads to disease and cancer. Mm. And it basically measures uh, cholesterol and other bits and pieces. So you need to make sure that your bloods are always done accordingly. And then from there, we go, this is what's right with you. This is what's wrong with you. This is the regime we're going to recommend for you to improve your health. And it could be a combination of supplements, hot and cold therapy, oxygen therapy, mm. and for example, red light therapy. Yeah. And this is the regime we put in place. Mm-hmm. So this is we're literally building it as we speak in Armadale in uh, Melbourne. Yeah, sensational. Yeah, when we uh, when we get the details of that, we'll put that in the show notes too. Definitely. So what's been in that journey? I know you just just mentioned ice bars, but you've done a few interesting things. Like you said like Cayman Islands and the US. So on on this journey, what's been the most? <laughs> what's been the Cayman most? Islands, that was random. I, I was going to give you a brief story about the Cayman but, Islands. But, so the amount of stem cells I, I stem cells I did in the Cayman Islands, it's illegal in most other countries. Yeah. So you can't you can't do it in the US. You can only do it in the in Costa Rica, Colombia, mm. Cayman Islands, and in a couple other countries. So I went there for five days, and they go, look, here's here's all the stem cells. It's in six huge vials, this big. And I was like, all right, let's do this. And remember, in the Cayman Islands, it's forty five degrees. It's boiling hot. I got the first vial. I'm like, okay, this is easy. It's a three-hour process. This is easy. Vial two, my body starts shaking. Vial three, sweats. Whole body was sweating. Vial four, whole body could not stop shaking. And I've got heat you, lamps because I've got the cold sweats. And I'm like, okay, this is... And I said, it's nothing to worry about. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not worried. Uh, and just before I was in there, they had the guy, um, Eddie... Eddie the Beast Hall, he's a he was the world's strongest man. He was oh, in there guy. just before me. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. He was in there halfway yeah. through the treatment. He had, he had to get up and walk around because it was because it's, it's a very intense treatment. He's a mm. big guy, and I'm like, shit, I'm already committed. Just let's finish this off because you've got you've got a drip in you. Yeah, sure. Six one, the fifth one, and then six one. Literally, you, you're literally rocking uncontrollably, just trying to get through the stem cells, and then. They take you off the bed. They're going to carry you off the bed because you can't walk. Yeah. Because remember, you're injecting a lot of this foreign substance to your body and your body's sure. just trying to reject it. Yeah. And then they, they put you in this couch and for three hours, you just rip in sweat. <laughs> and then after three hours, bang, it's all gone. Oh, well. You, you're back to normal. You're just tired. Yeah. So, yeah, I did that for, I did that for in the Cayman Islands and the results were my testosterone levels went up, my gray hair uh, receded or went, went back or declined. Would it, would it do yeah. anything? Do you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it could it could help. And yeah. I hope and I too far was, hold, I was holding muscle better. Yeah, well. right. interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah, but um, yeah. it definitely does work. But I've actually had more benefits from ice bath, which cost yeah. me nothing compared to yeah. The well, I've been doing that this year, this year as well, and man, it is it's unbelievable. Like, yeah, it's back actually unbelievable. A hard, hard ride. Like I live in this hilly part of um, the Sunshine Coast, and man, I get back from a hard ride, and you're cooked, right? And you just go and sit in that freezing cold water for three to five minutes, and you come out and go, "I feel fantastic." No, I think I think health wise, even yeah. connecting your bare feet to the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is like the, the, there's a thing called, as you probably know, called grounding, where basically grounding helps reduce inflammation in the body. Helps with supposedly helps with depression, and it's basically just connecting your bare feet to the earth. Yeah, and you're more likely to do that in the Sunshine Coast than you are in well, mate, cold you, Melbourne. You don't wear shoes up here very often. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, and we do we do uh, what's called board short business. We will have to do this sometime, which is where you meet at a cafe along the beach, and if you wear if you wear anything other than board shorts, you're not really allowed to enter. So, Nick, um, look, you're a father of three, three, three girls, is that right? Yeah, three daughters. Fantastic. Yeah, three. Um, <laughs> I've got I've got one and that is uh it is a it is a challenge. Uh she's she's got us she's got us really wrapped around her finger. How do you balance uh the the lifestyle that you lead around work and then the fitness regime and then and and feeling like you're you're nailing fatherhood? Yeah, look, it's that is a bit of a juggling act. So when I get home from work in the evening around seven, from seven to eight, I'm with the kids. Mm. So we'll have I usually have dinner at six. 
I have dinner around eight, but from seven to eight, I'm, I'm playing with the kids, hanging out with them, usually playing mind games or something with them, just kind of hanging, talking crap. Uh, and then one day in a weekend, it's always dedicated to the kids. Yeah, nice. Yeah, it's either we go for a bike ride or we go see somewhere or do something. It's one day. So there's actually, there's always, I always say there's always time. Mm. It's what you make a priority in life. So with work, I start work at say 7.30, I finish around 6.30. I can, I'm, I'm, like you, I can get a lot done in a day. Yeah. Like if I'm, if my head down, bum up, and I'm not running long meetings, I can get a shitload of work done. Yeah. That's a fact. And then on a, on a Saturday or Sunday, if we've got one day, I can do five hours of solid work. I can get a lot done. Mm, mm. And the good thing is if you have good managers, you don't need to be doing all the, the nitty gritty stuff. You mm. should be doing the bigger picture stuff, which I, which I want to be doing. So there's always, there's always enough time in the day. It's just, I, when I hear people say, I haven't got time like that, that is absolute BS. There's always time. It's just how you use your time effectively. So for example, if I'm, if I'm on the bathroom, I'm always on my phone. Like I can always, and I write short emails. It's like how I use my time. Yeah. yeah. You know, my, my mate had this great shirt and it was just said, my iPhone has changed the way I poo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty spot on there, that guy. Yeah. yeah but it's, yeah, but it's very, and even, um, I've, luckily I've got, a, I've got a gym at home, so yeah. I don't have to travel to the gym. So I save, just say half an hour there and back. Yeah. Yeah. So, and with, COVID now many people have home gyms. So there's there's all there's always time. It's just man, it's just don't watch Netflix. Mm. Yeah, or don't spend an hour on a phone call with your mate talking shit. Yeah. Mm. So I'd I'd rather either be work with my kids or doing something that I enjoy doing. Mm. Nice, nice. And I think um this uh like you're really thinking about the way you spend your time. And it's clearly values, like from a values first, right? I can hear the way you're talking. This is where it's coming from. Uh, and then it's when you do it, you just do it bloody well. Right? And you yeah, might, yeah. You might as well. Right? Chiefs, more from Nick in a minute. Now, recently I chatted with Ben Conn, co-founder and CEO of Taxi Box, on infusing fun and creativity into your brand, lessons on building a high performance culture and coping with anxiety. Here's what Ben had to say about advertising spend. We've also realized that creativity in marketing mm. um, allows you to not have to spend so much money on marketing, right? Because you're doing creative things. Yep. Mm. So someone actually said to me, it's, I've heard this, this saying, it's amazing. Advertising is the price you pay for being boring in business, right? So when you spend money on marketing dollars, that's the price that you are paying as a result of not building your brand. Uh, and that's a really powerful message, I think, generally for people that are going out and setting up their own business. You can listen to that brilliant chat with Ben by going to chiefmaker.com forward slash 292. And while you're there, you can subscribe, check out the whole back catalog, to just go to chiefmaker.com forward slash listen now. All right, Chief, let's get back to Nick Bell of Superist. Nick, um, mate, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I just want to finish with about uh, seven or eight uh, rapid fire questions. Just uh, here we uh, go. Okay, All right. If you could form the ultimate executive team, any well-known leader from anywhere in the world, from any time in history, basically anyone ever, who would your first three picks would be, and what roles in the executive team would you put them in? Uh, uh, definitely Elon Musk because he get he gets shit done. He would be leading yep. the team for sure. Yep. Steve Jobs marketing. Yep. And Warren Buffett advisory. Hell of a team, yeah. Elon, yeah. It, 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 love love him or hate him, Elon Musk he gets shit done. He's an absolute beast. Yeah, he is. Yeah. No, no one's on the, even close to his level. He, he can raise money. He gets. He starts multiple businesses. He's a genius. This guy. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. when people go, I don't have time. Look at Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah. And as you say, love him or hate him, whatever his philosophies are, that's all right. You just look at the the, the bank of work that guy has built. He's incredible, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. But people criticize him, and remember that people staff were saying that uh, Twitter's going to collapse. Yeah. Was going to go under. Hasn't gone offline. It's actually growing. 
it's actually revenues growing. It's actually more profitable than ever in terms of it's not losing as much money as it was. Mm. It, it doesn't need half the people. It's I always say the naysayers are always going to be naysayers in life, mm. and people like Elon thrive on that. Yeah, that's right. He actually, I think he uses them to his advantage. The guy, the guy gets marketing and comms right. Boy, I don't nails it. Quite, I don't think people understand how good he is at that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when he made Tesla, I mean, just the little things he gets. I think because he has a, a real eye for detail. Remember how mm. that cat, the car came out with the gull wing doors? Yeah, uh, and he said, oh, "I'm going to this car is so goddamn fast. We better make sure it can do a victory dance." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, he, you know, it's incredible. Like, what kind of car can actually do an automated victory dance where it waves its doors up and down? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, genius. Uh, that's just crazy. That's genius. Anyway, um, what's been the most valuable learning program of your career outside work experience? Uh, learning discipline from uh, from individuals that are doing far better than me. So it's 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 not in work, but it's still learning from others that are yeah. At a, at a high level of me. It's learning that discipline. Mm, yeah, nice. Um, a lot of leaders say they're so busy working in the business, they simply don't have time to work on it. What no bullshit counsel would you give someone in this space? That's on you, mate. You're, you're choosing to work in the business, not on the business, or you haven't got the right people in the business. Mm. So you're having to do their job for them. Yep. Uh, the best advice a mentor or coach has ever given you? Uh, buy property. And yeah, uh, but the thing is about property, it's off topic, but t- time heals all wounds and property almost. Yeah, yeah. So if you hold it for long enough, it's generally going to come back. Mm. And every most property I've bought and held on to, I'm like, you generally always make money on it. Yeah. Um, your number one interview question when looking for executives or senior managers to join your team? Uh, oh, that's a very good question because I've got a few of them. Um, I always like, I always tell me, I always said, tell me about your personal time. What are you doing in your mm. personal time? And if they're yeah, like, I interviewed someone this morning and he plays the bagpipes. Really? He plays the bagpipes. And I said, he goes, I'm, I'm, I love the bagpipes. Yeah. I'm very dedicated yeah. to it. Which from there, I can tell he's not a party boy. Yeah, he's he's very committed to his craft of bagpipes. He's going to go play in Edinburgh at the moment. Oh wow! So I mean, which means I know he's going to come on a Monday morning, hangover from work, hangover mm-hmm. from the weekend. Yeah. yeah. So I always ask about there. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your personal mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be or a sales guy. Talk to him about where he heads, where he wants to head to. And I said, tell me about your family. He goes, I've got three kids. I said, okay, he's got three kids. He needs to earn. Mm-hmm. He needs to earn, which means he needs to he needs to close deals. Otherwise, he can't pay for the family. Sure. Yeah. 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 You got three kids. You know what the cost. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I actually, since I have three kids, I go. I need to work harder. I need to work harder. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, if you could gift uh, one book uh, to someone coming up through the ranks, uh, what would that book be? Uh, it would be "Losing My Virginity" by Richard Sir Richard Branson. Great book. Because that, that's why she started me on my entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, it's a cracker. Right? Yeah. Uh, can you nominate another CEO you have with great respect you think should be on the podcast? Uh, David Schaefer, who heads up Kogan. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, we'll see if we He's, can. Dave's the smartest guy in the room. Genius. Wow. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's try, see if we can lure him into the show. Okay, two more questions, mate. If you could lead any company in the world other than your own, what would it be? An existing company. Oh, geez. Uh, I would love to run a listed company. So, and I'd love to take a listed company from zero to hero. So I don't mind as long as it's it has potential to grow, that I would love to do. So, yeah, uh, just a, a, a listed company on the NASDAQ. What, why listed? Because I think I could turn around. I think these a lot of these CEOs of listed companies, they just waste too much time in meetings. I want to come in there and actually get shit done. Mm. And I think I could turn it around. I think I could turn it around fairly quickly. Mm. That's not arrogance. It's just being confident in my ability to deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last question. What is a final message of wisdom and hope you think is vital for the next generation of chiefs? Take advantage of the current economy and put the work in and you'll get the results. There is so much opportunity out there right now that I would tell my younger self, learn AI get into digital and be an absolute savage. 
Mm. And in t- five, ten years' time, you'll be on fire. Yeah, nice one. Nick, mate, thanks for coming on The Inner Chief. You've got a, a fantastic legacy already, mate, and, and there's a lot more in front of you. We can't wait to watch. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All Take right. care. Thanks, Greg. Chiefs, that sums it up for this week. Wow, what an interesting and inspiring character is Nick Bell. Surely taking the world by storm and some nuggets there for all of us to save you and think about and just ponder how we might do our jobs a little bit more effectively with a little bit more impact. Chiefs, all the resources and show notes, including links, can be found at chiefmaker.com forward slash 293. And don't forget, if you want to get all the latest tips and tricks on how to be the very best in your job and live a life of meaning, go to chiefmaker.com forward slash subscribe and I'll send you curated high quality material so that you can be armed to the teeth to be the very best chief you can be. Now, Chief, if you're yet to rate the episode and subscribe, I hope you'll do so soon. It helps others see the magnificent value that the chiefs and gurus on the show bring to their life and career. So make sure you hit subscribe on your podcast app now. Give it a five-star rating if you think it's worthy and leave a short review about your favourite episode. Righto, Chief. As always, remember to stay...